Welcome to today's XBO Soft webinar, Not Your Grandfather's Requirements-Based Testing. Do Agile User Stories or ATDD Fix It? With testing and requirements expert Robin Goldsmith. This webinar is presented by us here at XBO Soft, a software testing and quality assurance company dedicated to speeding products to market and ensuring improved software quality and performance through our QA consulting and software testing expertise. We were founded in 2006, and we're an American company with a global team and offices in San Francisco and Beijing. And, of course, today's house rules are as follows. Participants will be in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please use the control on the right-hand side of your screen or send them to us at Twitter at XBOSoft. Questions may be asked throughout the webinar, and we'll try to answer them at the end, but if we can't, we will answer them on our blog. And all participants will receive information on the recording after the webinar. If you do decide to send questions to us on Twitter, please use the hashtag TestCaseTips. I'm Rachel Geibig, the Marketing Manager here at XBO Soft, and i like to introduce Philip Liu, CEO and Founder of XBO Soft. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, it's great to be here. Um, really, today is not about me, but really about our speaker, uh, Robin Goldsmith. And Robin, I met Robin a couple of years ago at uh, speaking at um, a conference, and we kind of struck it off talking about uh, agile and requirements and the difficulties in um, getting requirements to the point where they could be used as used as a requirement. And there's, I've read a lot of Robin's uh, books and articles and so forth, and I thought that I'd, he would be a great um, speaker to have here in our in our webinar series. Um, I'll just let Robin take it away, and you know what I'll do is. Uh, ask you questions as we go along and represent the audience and because uh, I'm sure the audience will have a lot of questions as well so I'll let you um, start your show there Robin okay well thank you Phil and uh, so as Phil mentioned uh, both he and I tend to travel in uh, the conference circuit and uh, one of the conferences that both of us will be at is the PSQT conference in August in San Diego, and uh, we'll be featured presenters there. And uh, Phil's giving a keynote in the deleted last year as well. So uh, uh, it's a, a good conference and a beautiful site, and uh, we encourage you to attend there. And there's another conference, uh, the Pacific Northwest Software Quality Conference. And Phil is uh, uh, one of the uh, organizers of that and uh, was nice enough to uh, invite me to uh, uh, give an invited uh, presentation. So I'll be doing that as well. So you can find out more about uh, uh, each of those events, either contact us or uh, look on the internet. So title is something about not your grandfather's requirements based tests. And so let me suggest that in the olden days, uh, requirements based tests were no big deal. You took your requirements, you tested each one had been satisfied correctly. And as Homer Simpson would say, duh, no big deal. But in fact, of course, it's never been easy, but it's, it's gotten trickier. And so requirements-based tests are a fundamental, essential type of test. I mean, and, and they seem obvious. There are only one or two little issues, and I'm gonna, do like a David Letterman count back from 10, except I'm counting back from three. So number three, how to identify the tests that are based on requirements. Number two, oh, by the way, what are requirements? And 
for a lot of people, there's the question of what requirements. Unfortunately, too many of us, uh, uh, you know, have have uh, projects where the requirements are, uh, uh, to be gracious, not well defined. Now we're going to start by looking at identifying tests, and then we'll work our way backward on this. So what we want to do is help you recognize some test design techniques that some people equate with requirements-based testing. That is, there are a number of people that when they use the term requirements-based testing, have in mind some particular specific technique. And uh, so we'll look at some of those and see what some of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of that are. And I want to make a, an important distinction because the term requirements is used in many different ways. One of the big distinctions that I make, and unfortunately, I fear a lot of people don't make these distinctions, which is a, a major reason in, in my experience why people get into difficulty, is that there's a difference between what I call real business requirements and product or system or software requirements. And test requirements-based tests that are testing against real business requirements can provide considerably different and frankly far greater value than testing against product system or software requirements. And I fear that too many people don't understand that and aren't even aware of the distinction. And a lot of people these days are uh, defining requirements in terms of user stories or user story acceptance criteria. Acceptance uh, test-driven development is often the term that's used. And while these, each of these techniques has some strengths, each of them also brings with it some issues, and if you're not aware of the issues, then they're much more likely to trip you up. So I would guess that many, if not all of you, uh, have a need to test that requirements are met. And I'm going to suggest that awareness of what's involved in that or greater awareness of what's involved in that is a critical starting point for doing more effective requirements-based testing. So a big part of what I'm hoping to do today is simply to create greater awareness of some of the important things that I'm aware of, at least, with regard to requirements-based testing. So we're going to start by looking at some low-level test design techniques that some gurus or authorities often claim are requirements-based testing. And then I want to introduce for many of you, hopefully not for not an introduction for everybody, but for some of you, this distinction between real business requirements and product system software requirements and what difference that makes with regard to testing. Okay. And then we want to look at challenges, identifying what the requirements are and some of the strengths and issues of agile user stories and agile user story acceptance tests. So hopefully this is understandable and also in line with your needs and interests. And so I'm going to ask a couple of rhetorical questions here. Um, I'm not really expecting answers from you, but if you do want to uh, give us a little feedback uh, with regard to, to this question, um, you know, that would be great. So I'm just going to leave the question here for a second. What does requirements-based testing mean to you? 
Now I'm going to ask you, uh, if you would, to quickly in the chat box uh, type what requirements-based testing means to you, and then I'm going to list uh, several common answers. So I'm not really trying to do a poll here. I'm hoping uh, that you will uh, provide us some open-ended answers there. And uh, if if your experience is like most, there's a good chance that uh, what you say will be one of the things that I list here. And if not, we'll take it under advisement as best we can. So, um, okay. So Robert, the first thing, yeah. I have a question for you. You mentioned uh, acceptance test driven development, and then we have RBT here. Are they really? kind of like the same thing, but going in the other direction. They're not like really opposed to each other. They're just kind of very related. You're starting with um, kind of requirements in terms of testing and then developing to meet those things. So that would be ATDD. And then the other way around is what we're talking about here, RBT. So are they kind of like the same thing, but then in the opposite direction? Well, not exactly. I mean, acceptance test driven development is to some people requirements-based testing. Oh, okay. okay. Hmm. So, and, and that's part of, that's part of the, uh, the issue here. So have we gotten any answers here um, from anybody? Any volunteers? I uh, know they, people didn't expect to have to work at uh, this hour of the day. Okay. So, well, let me, let me share with you a number of things that I've heard from various people, and you can you can see whether any of these fit with your own thinking. So, first of all, confirming that documented requirements have been met. So that's a that's a pretty straightforward thing, right? Um, how about confirming that undocumented requirements are met? This uh, is a much less likely thing, and. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the undocumented requirements tend to be far greater in number usually than the documented ones. And so some people, when they say requirements-based testing, that means they're relying on the users to do the testing. And there is some kind of a presumption that somehow or another, the tests that users will think to do are reflective of what the requirements are or should be. Uh, I think you can uh, you know, question the accuracy of that presumption. What we're gonna talk about in a minute are a number of specific low-level test design techniques that somebody has endeavored to equate to requirements-based testing. Some technique that some somebody tends to specialize in, and they've declared that that technique means requirements-based testing. Uh, similarly, some people say that requirements-based testing means exercising use cases. And I'm sure that many of you are familiar with use cases and uh, how they uh, can translate into tests essentially by exercising the use cases, to exercise the various paths or scenarios through the use case. And a use case is a format that is often used for documenting requirements. And then there may be some other specific test case design technique uh, that people have equated to requirements-based testing and then all of the other stuff that uh, does tend to show up. Although I think, you know, one through five, and, and unfortunately number two uh, doesn't get much attention, but one through five are what people generally mean by requirements-based testing. If anybody has any additional thoughts or comments here, certainly would welcome them. I'm not going to uh, delay the presentation, uh, but I, you know, would appreciate anybody's thoughts there. So there are a number of uh, primarily testing 
uh, authorities or instructors or authors or speakers, uh, gurus from somebody's perspective, um, who have declared that a particular technique that they favor equals requirements-based testing. And so a number of these authorities or authors uh, essentially are trying to appropriate the term requirements-based testing to make it theirs. And they typically are pushing or emphasizing some particular uh, low-level technique, uh, ordinarily helping uh, systematically elaborate business rules, okay, such as uh, So for some reason, my screen isn't advancing properly here. Hold on while it catches up with itself. So decision trees and decision tables, and we'll look at them in a minute. Uh, logic mapping, uh, things like cause and effect graphing. Uh, some of you may be familiar with white box or structural testing. and Within structural testing, there are some systematic ways to design or define tests, give varying degrees of coverage. And what these logic mapping uh, techniques tend to do is apply a structural white box approach to uh, functionality. And so they're, they're providing a degree of discipline to exercising or, or demonstrating functionality, business rule functionality, that might not be there or might not be evident just from the business rule itself. So so, so there's another uh, variant on this, and this is exercising use cases. And uh, the nice thing about use cases is that you can uh, define or identify in a very systematic manner what the paths through the use case are, or the various scenarios. There's typically a happy path, an alternate success path, an exception failure path. And if you exercise each one of those, uh, that will um, essentially exercise the use case in all possible ways. Now, what you have to realize is that if you pick one of these techniques and declare that it equals requirements-based testing, then there's a good chance that you're gonna fool yourself and that it's easy for the focus on one method to mask or obscure other things, including requirements that have been missed and including often requirements that are bigger or more important. So zeroing in on detail can detract us or distract us rather from some of the bigger, more important things. Ironically, some of these techniques, because of their discipline and even rigor, can end up identifying so many potential tests that that can become overwhelming. So even if a particular technique is missing a lot of stuff, it can hide that by creating or by defining a huge number of tests, more than ordinarily would be identified. And in spite of all of this, not only is it easy, but likely that significant requirements will still be overlooked. And I would, I would suggest that these pitfalls are kind of important. So, some of you may be familiar with decision trees. 
decision trees. Uh, there are a number of different formats that are used. Uh, this format is kind of a generic one. So if we find the customer by ID, then we can place an order for them. If we don't find them by ID, we maybe can find them by phone number and then place the order. If we don't find them by phone number, maybe we could find them searching alphabetically by name and then place the order. If we don't have them just by name, maybe we can find them by name within zip code and then place the order. If we can't find them at all, we could add them and place the order. So this type of uh, graphical technique for, for uh, laying out uh, uh, business rule logic or business logic in, in this case um, is, is a valuable method. Uh, uh, you know, this is essentially the type of logic that programmers are expected to be able to implement accurately day in and day out. And um, testers, if testers are going to be providing a reasonable independent confirmation that the developers did what they should have done, then it's important that the table same type of analysis, not simply relying on the developer's analysis, but figuring it out independently. But a, a technique like this can make it much clearer. And so by laying out the choices like this, very often we help identify options or conditions that might otherwise have been overlooked. So I'll ask you if anybody would like to uh, chat real quickly, uh, which of these conditions would be most likely to be overlooked, if, especially if we didn't use some kind of a systematic structured technique like this? Anybody have any thoughts on which of these conditions is most likely to be overlooked? So please chat your answer real quick. Uh, uh, see if we get any answers here. And uh, I'm wondering about the add vendor thing. I'm not quite clear on that. Ah, so if you're if you're trying to to uh, place an order with a vendor, and you cannot find the vendor already on file, then you could add the vendor and then place an order for the vendor. Does that make sense, Phil? Okay, well, I guess that so might be one that we're missing then. That might be one that might be overlooked. Is that what yeah, you're saying? I think so. Okay, could be, could be. And people might find that searching by name within zip code might be kind of an unusual condition. Um, actually, the condition that is most likely to be overlooked is exit. Even though it's right there in front of us, it's very commonly overlooked, and I'm sure that many of us have experienced this firsthand, um, you know, that there's uh, uh, no way to get out of a routine, uh, and uh, it's very annoying, but it happens all the time. So at any rate, using a, a systematic technique like this uh, is a helpful test design technique. It can also be helpful for analyzing requirements. And some people would say that using this type of a technique is what requirements-based testing means. Other people uh, claim that uh, requirements-based testing is using decision tables. Now, decision tables or another technique for analyzing business rules. And um, so the, the essence of, and there are many formats that decision tables take. This one is fairly common. So at the top, we list a number of conditions. Each column represents a separate set of responses to those conditions. And at the bottom are the actions to be taken. So if we match on ID, yes, then we can, yes, place the order. If we match on phone number, yes, then yes, we could place the order. If we select the name from the list, yes, then we could place the order. If we select the name from the zip code name list, 
yes, then we could place the order. If we don't match on ID, if we don't match on phone number, if we don't select the name from either the name list or the name within zip code list, but we do add the vendor, then yes, we could place the order. So that's uh, uh, a nice technique for helping analyze business rules because each column represents a separate scenario for which you could have a test case that exercised that scenario. And so this format is, is a very nice format because it relates very directly to identifying test cases. Now, question is, is this decision table correct? real simple and easy to follow, I think, but is it correct? Phil, what do you think? It certainly looks correct for what the way that you explained it, but I'm sure that there's things that are missing. Well, for instance, um, do you remember exit? Yeah, so exit's not on there. Oh, so did you notice how easy it was to overlook stuff, even though we're using a technique that supposedly helps us avoid overlooking things? And it's the same thing that we spotted on the prior screen that was overlooked. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's, there's much more that has been overlooked. So indeed, we do need exit. So if exit is chosen, then yes, we exit. That's the action. But in fact, these five scenarios are just the tip of the iceberg. There are dozens of other combinations of these particular values. So starting over here, yes, it's a phone match on phone number. That's a different test case from first having no match on ID and then yes, having a match on phone number. Okay. And similarly, um, uh, over here, selecting name, that's different from having no match on ID, no match on phone number, and then selecting the name. Now, what is hard to see from the decision table is that the decision table does not show sequence. So there are many additional combinations, sequences that we cannot reflect in a decision table. That is, no match on ID, no match on phone number, yes, select the name from the list and place the order, is a physically and logically different different test case from first having no match on phone number, then no match on ID, then yes, selecting the name and placing the order. So there are many additional columns that need to be here to reflect that any given cell could be yes, no, or blank. In other words, not addressed, and that the number of combinations of those is quite extensive. Um, and that if we stretched this out, so indeed we covered every choice, every, every possible combination, we would need many, many more columns. And none of those columns would be appropriate for showing that the same combination, for instance, no, no, yes, was carried out in a different sequence. And that becomes you know, even more complex when we've got more no's. So the decision table is helpful to a point, but it runs out of capability as situations become more complex and as we have more and more conditions. So uh, it's helpful, but it's very easy to miss things. 
and you, uh, sequence is not going to be reflected. And the more conditions that you've got, the more combinations, or it's just going to become unwieldy. So have I said that decision trees and decision tables are bad techniques? I hope not. That's, that's not what I'm intending to convey. But I do want you to realize that they are, they are not mindless. Now, I mentioned the concept of structural or white box coverage. And a lot of, a lot of testers uh, uh, may not be familiar with this. In, in the, the structural coverage, structural coverage basically says, have you exercised what is there? Uh, as opposed to black box testing, which says, I don't care how you did it, did you get the right answer for a given set of inputs and or conditions? And structural coverage has four common degrees of coverage. The simplest and least demanding is, have we executed a module or routine from its entry to its exit? So a module or routine is considered to be a piece of functionality that has a single entry point and a single exit point. And so have we simply done it is generally not very instructive. If we can't even get the thing to, to go from start to end, uh, it's basically dead on arrival. But more commonly, structural coverage is evaluated within a module or a routine. And so the most common, easily understood degree of coverage is that every line of code or every step has been executed. This would be the degree of coverage that a developer or development manager is probably most likely to be conscious of. Folks who pay more attention to this, people like like IEEE and NASA and IBM and so forth, um, use a more demanding degree of coverage. That is, that every branch has been executed. And this is sometimes called complete coverage. Um, and to help us with this, and then most demanding is that every possible way from entry to exit has been executed. And to help us with this, we can use a graphical technique. It's kind of a shorthand logic diagram called a flow graph. And the flow graph only has two symbols. The node, which is represented by a circle, and there's a node for each end, for the entry point, for the exit point, and for each place where logic branches. In other words, an if statement. And anywhere where logic comes back together again, called a junction. And then the other symbol in a flow graph is called an edge. And the edge simply represents all the logic between two nodes. So if the first if statement is true, we're going to take this black edge down to the exit. Now, this black edge, this path from the first node to the, to the last, could be a single instruction. It could be a million instructions. If it's a million instructions, there are probably lots and lots of little flow graphs along the way. But each of them is going to end up returning to this edge so that we'll end up always getting to this final node. So we've got a false condition. If the first statement is false, we're going to go to the right down the blue path. I don't know if you can see that that's blue as opposed to black. And then on the second if statement, if it's true, we're going to take the blue path. And if it's false, we're going to take the red path. So the logic paths degree of coverage or exhaustive coverage 
says that in this example, if we have a test that executes the black path and a test that executes the blue path and a test that executes the red path, then those three tests together will have executed that flow graph, that piece of logic in every possible way. And, uh, you know, so a lot of people find that structural techniques are, are much more disciplined uh, than black box techniques, which don't really have a way to give you assurance of what the various tests are that you need to have some confidence or, or a particular degree of coverage uh, confidence. So these are techniques that are often considered to be relevant only for programmers, for developers, uh, because this type of a technique is often applied to evaluating uh, how much of the code we've executed. But in fact, we can use the same technique and related techniques with regard to um, logic. Now, cause and effect graphing is a even more disciplined way for analyzing uh, the logic uh, beyond simply the paths, because it takes into account a couple of additional conditions. It takes into account um, the, the V, which means or, the inverted V, which means and, and the tilde, which means not. So here's the way that, uh, that we exercise this. Okay, so we've got this uh, business rule down here at the bottom. Pay the damage claim, uh, you know, when the insured is at fault or the accident is caused by an uninsured motorist and their premium has been paid or when they are within the payment grace period. So that's, uh, that's the way that a lot of business rules are written. And I'm sure that many of you come from organizations that not only have many business rules, but many business rules that are far more complicated than this. But we can use the cause and effect graphing technique to help uh, analyze and structure our approach to uh, uh, understanding and then creating tests to confirm that the business rule has been satisfied. So textual representations like the business rule at the lower right hand corner uh, tend to be hard to interpret. People make mistakes when they're dealing with natural language. So the structuring of the cause and effect graph helped to make this much more clear and lead, enable us to create more thorough, more uh, uh, powerful tests. So the cause and effect graph says that if the insured person is at fault or the person at fault is uninsured and the premium has been paid or they are within the grace period, then pay the claim. Now, I suspect that for most of you, uh, this is not a familiar uh, uh, technique, but I think most of you could become comfortable with it very quickly. And I think you can see that it tends to break that uh, uh, narrative text into much more identifiable paths uh, that need to be demonstrated to uh, give us confidence that this works. Okay. So there are tools that will use this technique to define an optimized set of rigorous tests of all the variances. Okay. Of course, that what they don't take into account are any things that are overlooked. Now we can use the same approach, the graph, uh, flow graph approach, for uh, analyzing use cases and identifying 
uh, the paths or scenarios to test. So for instance, enter a vendor ID, U1, R1.1, the vendor is found, we go down to U4 and we enter the order, drop through to R4, the order is entered and we exit. If the vendor is not found, we could go down to U2, enter the vendor name. If we find the vendor in the list and select them, we'll go down to U4, enter the order, drop through to R4, and the order is entered and we exit. If the vendor is not in the list, we'll go down to U3, add the vendor, R3, the vendor is added, we drop down to U4, enter the order, drop through to R4, and the order is entered. So if you can remember this, sequence of events for a second. Let me show you a flow graph of it. So this is the one where we uh, enter the vendor ID and the vendor ID is found. Okay. Here, the vendor ID is not found. Okay. And uh, uh, we enter the vendor name and we find them, select them in the list and drop through uh, U4 and, and R4, the order is entered. And here, the vendor is not in the list, so we add the vendor U3, the R3, the vendor is added, U4, we enter the order and drop through. And so conventional wisdom is that these three paths, tests exercising these three paths, will exercise that use case in every possible way. And that's, uh, it's a widely used testing technique. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it and, and rely on it. Uh, there's only one or two problems. There are a lot of additional conditions. I've listed a couple of them, but we could exit from anywhere, and they weren't really reflected in the use case. And in fact, there are a couple of conditions missing. What R3.1, if the ad fails, okay? R4.1, if entering the order fails. And then we could carry this out, not not starting at U1, but U, or starting at U3, or starting at U4, and then from there, there are any number of additional paths. So these are these are all things that limit the effectiveness of equating to use cases. Okay, so. Anybody who says one of these techniques equals requirement-based testing is by definition excluding all the other techniques, and they're gonna have different things. There are all kinds of other types of requirements uh, that are not necessarily addressed here. These tend to address only business rules, but there are other functionality and calculations, database stuff. Okay, and all the quality factors are ill at ease and environmental stuff. And none of these techniques will address an overlooked requirement of any type. So these are all issues, which brings us to the fact that requirements-based tests are only as good as the requirements. And unfortunately, for most organizations, requirements aren't very good. Okay, and that uh, we'll see that a lot of what people call requirements are actually forms of design. So let's look at what happens. When we go about developing a system, we start by identifying the requirements. Some of those are required and defined appropriately, and some of those are in error. They could be missed, they could be extra, they could be misdefined. When we go from requirements to design, some of the appropriate requirements are included in an appropriate design, and some are lost in translation. Now, we don't just lose meaning in translation from when we go from uh, you know, one language to another, it's when we go from one artifact or one deliverable to another. The same thing happens all the way through uh, the development process, okay? And so what's happening is that the requirements uh, uh, are the biggest factor in errors. Once something is wrong, it tends to stay wrong. Okay? Testers tend 
to be confirming that what's built is what's designed. But Developers are perfectly capable of in implementing incorrect designs, and testers are perfectly capable of confirming that that design has been implemented with neither the developer nor the tester having a clue that the design is wrong. Okay. And simply confirming that a design has been satisfied is on uh, changes to things, maintenance changes, you know, are where the bulk of costs arise. What people tend not to appreciate is that much of maintenance is not new and unpredictable, it's wrong and it's fixing, it's becoming aware of and fixing wrong and missed requirements. And that two thirds of the errors in finished systems are typically ones that have been there from the beginning. Ones that typical developers and typical testers would not really be bumping into because they're errors that are already in the design. And the significance of this, of course, is that the longer it takes to catch an error, in general, the more expensive it is. And we're talking about orders of magnitude of expense. Now, there's a pretty good chance that your organization does not have routine measures that enable people to see those effects. And what's the relevance? Well, the relevance is that people never have ways to know how good their requirements are, and in turn, don't have ways to see how to make requirements-based tests more, ac more accurate. So there are what are called business or uh, real business requirements. These are from the perspective of and in the language of the business, the user, the stakeholder, the customer. They are conceptual and they exist within the business environment. They are what's, what's that provide value when they are satisfied or met or delivered. And they provide value by serving business objectives, solving business needs, solving problems, taking opportunities, meeting challenges. There are usually many possible ways to accomplish them. Product, system, software requirements are from the perspective of a human defined product or system. Humans define designs. That product or system is one of those many possible ways, presumably how to presumably accomplish the presumed business requirements. Okay. And these are often also called uh, functional specifications or functional requirements, and then there are non-functional ones that go along with it. Now, conventional wisdom is that creep occurs because requirements, meaning product requirements on the right, and by the way, if you look at how the word requirements is generally used in your world, there's a good chance that when people say requirements, they are talking about requirements of the product system or software that they intend to create. And the conventional wisdom is that creep occurs because the product requirements on the right are not sufficiently clear or testable. Well. I'm gonna suggest that much creep occurs because the product requirements on the right, regardless of how clear and testable they are, turn out not to satisfy the real business requirements on the left. And the primary reason why the product requirements on the right don't satisfy the real business requirements on the left is because the real business requirements on the left have not been defined adequately primarily because people think mistakenly that product requirements are the requirements. So to be fair, many people um, do use the term business requirements and often in what I would call uh, the levels model of requirements, which I would suggest is mistaken. 
according to the levels model, the difference between business requirements and product requirements is simply a level of detail or abstraction. And according to the levels model, business requirements are high level and vague and decompose into product system software requirements, which are detailed. So if you have a detailed requirement, it's a product requirement. If you have a high level requirement, it's a business requirement. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Okay, But the fact is that this is mistaken. It's mistaken because business requirements are what and product requirements are how what do not decompose into how rather how is a response to what and all the detail in the world on the how won't make up for the fact that you don't know what the what's are and so people who follow the levels model actually are contributing to creating creep so the key to reducing creep is to realize that business requirements are not just high level and vague, but need to be driven down to detail. And that when you drive them down to detail, then it becomes much more straightforward to map them to a product system or software that in fact will satisfy the real business requirements. Now, notice what happens in terms of testing. If you are simply testing that the defined product has been built, there is no reason to believe, or no confirmation at least, that that product is the right product to satisfy the real business requirement. That's why it's so important to test against the real business requirement. So let's look how this falls together. Stakeholders have the needs and the problems and the value to be obtained. Through discovery and analysis, we identify high level and then detailed real business or stakeholder requirements. Business deliverable what's that provide value. These are the true user requirements. Okay? And that discovery and analysis should be iterative. Okay? Products are features and hows that respond to the what's. And they sometimes are broken into functional requirements, which are often uh, defined as use cases, okay, which are actually not user requirements, but use edge requirements of the expected product system software. Or they could be defined as software requirements, specifications, the system shall. And then the non functional requirements or quality factors or illities go along with that. The product is the basis for the high level and detail technical and engineering design, which in turn is what produces code. So if we test based upon simply the product requirements, we will confirm that they've built what they said they would build but that doesn't mean that what they said they would build is what they should have built. So more effective tests should be based upon the real business requirements to demonstrate that the product house in fact satisfy the what and thereby provide real value. Okay. And I would can suggest that that's unconventional wisdom, but true wisdom. Okay. Now, a lot of people say, well, we, we're agile. We use user stories and we write user story acceptance tests. Okay. And so writing user stories and acceptance tests for them um, may be necessary, but perhaps not sufficient. Okay. And one of the reasons is because the strength of user stories is that they are brief and simple. And the weakness of that is that they're brief and simple, which means that lots of things get taken for granted, including the user story acceptance criteria and the tests based upon them. They're often not as thorough as assumed. Okay? And then there are other things that can cause that user story requirement, the 
content to deteriorate, such as common practice of throwing them out, uh, so that it's kind of hard to trace back to what it was that you thought you were doing in, in the first place. And then there's this other aspect of it. So a user story is typically as a such and such, I want such and such so that I can get some reason satisfied. Okay, And that's often referred to as a placeholder for a conversation. Okay. And so what happens is that user stories can be and should be identifying real business requirements, business deliverable what. But then there is this conversation that goes from the what passes any kind of design straight to code. And perhaps you can imagine some of the difficulties that could occur in that situation. So you know, we have what's called the card, the confirmation. So the card is the user story, the confirmation is, and that's on the front of the card, the confirmation, the user story acceptance criteria are on the back. And then that leads to a conversation. And the idea is that the conversation leads to code and the code should uh, uh, fit the user's story acceptance tests and ultimately uh, deliver what the, what the user's story wanted. That's, that's the good news. Okay. What's the bad news? Well, all, this, all of the conversation tends not to be captured. So it should be the source of a lot of those requirements-based tests, but because it is seldom captured and is probably more in terms of uh, design and, and construction rather than requirements, uh, you're very unlikely to have requirements-based tests. And then what also often happens is that the user stories are in fact describing product features. That's a form of design, high level design, not the uh, real business requirements. So based upon user stories that are features of the product, we're gonna confirm that the product is built, but it doesn't confirm that it's the right product. So here's a simple example of a requirements-based test replacing an order and the requirement is to calculate sales tax at the rate of 5% on the order. A requirements-based test might have as input to enter an item for $99.99. The expected result is that the sales tax should be $5. Okay. So that's, that's a requirements-based test. Now, if we then use techniques to identify acceptance criteria. And we can do this either from a user story standpoint or from a broader, what I call proactive uh, user acceptance criteria standpoint. Uh, we might identify some additional conditions you know, that we have to have both taxable and non-taxable items. We have to have orders that cover more than a page have to be able to handle credits and returns, and we have to be able to do this for states and localities with different rates. Now, the reason that I'm hedging my bet on whether this is user story acceptance criteria or types of things that unfortunately user story acceptance criteria often miss is because I would suggest that the user story that says we got to calculate sales tax at the rate of 5% very well may never give rise to any of these acceptance criteria because user stories tend to be drawn very narrowly. So are we defining acceptance criteria or are we revealing additional requirements? Okay, doesn't much matter because if you don't know those requirements, you're gonna end up with problems regardless. Okay. So, content, not format, is the big issue regardless of what you call it. 
if you if you're missing stuff you've got a problem if you can reveal it before it becomes a bigger problem then you've gotten benefit and you can create tests uh, for things that you've identified as requirements but you very hard to create tests for requirements that have been overlooked so tie this together should be able to recognize various test design techniques that people equate with requirements-based testing. We mentioned several of those, uh, distinguished real business requirements from product system software requirements, and try to emphasize to you that you need to make sure that what's built is satisfying the real business requirements, not just the product requirements. And user stories and user story acceptance criteria can be useful, but they are also easily mistaken. And they are, user stories should really be related to real business requirements, frequently are not. And because they're so narrowly drawn and because of the conversations, it's easy to lose sight. So um this is just a diagram of some of the courses and consulting that i do and their relationship to the various phases of the life cycle so writing requirements defining and managing requirements i also do a lot of work in testing so phil hey robin take it can, away robin could you go back two slides to the to your final slide there i was thinking about something there um, um can you go backwards? Yeah, one more back. Yeah, I was looking at that. I was thinking that um, really that puts a big, uh, larger burden or bigger responsibility on the product owner in terms of really understanding what the, not just what the product is supposed to do um, from requirements, like you said, from the product point of view, but from the business point of view. And sometimes, you know, the customer might not even know what they, what their business requirement is. I find that that's very often the case, and then you you get lots and lots of happy uh, happy sprints, and you're building working software and building working software, building working software, and then all of a sudden it doesn't do what's needed, and you have to go back and and change it. I guess the, the big thing is uh, it works, but so what, right? Exactly. So demonstrating <laughs> that it that it fits the design is only part of the story and it's not the more important part of the story right right huh. okay well um i guess we'll close it up here uh, rachel so did we have any questions from anybody i don't think so um so either we've filled them completely or, da or dazzled them or baffled them so if you do have questions, folks, don't hesitate to drop them an email to us, and uh, you can send them to uh, XPOsoft, uh, services at xposoft.com, and, and Phil or Rachel will forward them to me. Yes. Uh, well, thank you so much again, Robin. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, we did record this webinar, so registrants will receive an email with the information on where to view the recording and the slides. And if you have any other questions, feel free to continue tweeting them to us at XBOsoft. Um, and stay tuned for our next webinar. But until then, you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Google Plus and LinkedIn for updates on future webinars, reports, and white papers. You can also check us out and visit our blog or download our most recent white papers at XBOsoft.com. And be sure to contact us with future ideas for webinars and questions regarding our services. Thank you.